I'm Sean Haney from realagriculture.com and Real Ag Radio. In the first video, Blake and Jeannie outlined the importance of the lentil and pea crop to Blake's farm and the larger pulse growing region of Montana and North Dakota. In this video, we'll hear about the scope of the damage, what it means for the future for pulses, and how farmers working with campuses and extension to identify the disease and engaging in best agronomic management practices will help all involved to keep pulse crops in the rotation. You kind of ask yourself, what do we do next, right? And being the chemicals that are on here, um, this field probably won't see lentils again for five to six years. We'll probably come in with, it'll be derm, canola, derm, chickpeas, derm. Then we may try lentils six years out. See where, I think we're gonna try to work on um, the soil, you know, so the other factor in here that people don't talk about is the soil structure itself. I mean, if there was disease, the soil was compacted. And it didn't have to be the obvious, like approaches, ends, you know, where you know you're going to have compaction. One of the consequences to zero till that we maybe weren't always taking into account is that compaction is very cumulative. This year was pretty wet when it was seeded, so I think we probably, like, did a lot of compaction this year that we don't think about all the time. Um, but every single place that had disease, it was tough to get a shovel in a week later. And the roots are showing that sign of compaction. Now, the, the soil's platy, the roots are growing through those plate layers, they're not expanding well. Everything looked healthy up until the point where the root disease set in, but the compaction was very real. Like where does compaction happen in zero till, 20 years of zero till, kind of everywhere, it turns out. Obviously this crop has plenty of disease and will continue to create inoculum, but that first tipping point year, you might not even know that it was the, like that was your critical year until years down the road. Now it's the following crops where you see the injury. This disease explodes right. on a healthy appearing crop, but that's the host for that explosion of the disease. What you're looking for with lentils, um, I'm looking for, first of all, that top portion of the root. Is it white? Is it bone colored? And does it still have a lot of structure to it? Does it feel nice and firm? You get into the diseased areas, that top portion of the root is brown. Um, it may be completely rotted away. And that happened really fast this year, actually. Some of that was completely rotted out. Or the outside layers are rotted. There's just the inside part of the root left that's not rotted. But the color is really indicative of whether or not it has disease. White is good, brown is never good. Then looking down into the lower root, you know, do you have secondary roots or are they already rotted off? Um, how does nodulation look? If you've got a healthy lentil, you should have, you know, like this much above ground, you should have roots in this much soil below ground. Is it expanding out into that or is it two inches of root, two side roots, one nodule? That's a plant that's on its way out because that below ground injury you don't see it now, mm -hmm. but then we would see in July when they were trying to fill, they would run out of moisture because that stem was rotted. We're really going to have to come up with a lot of our own efforts to solve this. What we're trying to do is we're working with the universities, um, the extension services and the researchers. We'd like to see develop a tool where we can use soil samples and be more predictive instead of just like, well, nine years, six to be you. It's more of like this field is high risk, this field we have an opportunity. So we're not trying to compare these crop histories to rainfall patterns and guessing at it, hoping for one more lentil crop. Maybe we can be a little more educated. Um, there's the Pulse Working Group is one of the extension and university groups, um, the researchers at the pathology labs. Is it root disease or is it herbicide injury? Making sure that we're calibrated correctly in the field, working with that network. Um, so I think first of all, we're just hoping for predictive, can we still grow our best economic crop? <laughs> on these fields in this area. Um, obviously we need to work towards plant breeding to grow lentils that are maybe a little bit more resistant to it. Um, looking at the soil stuff, like how do we stay zero till but get our soils in better shape? You know, short term, we just need a better predictive tool. Long term, we need a crop that can still be this good economically, but also grow in our soils. It's a multi-prong approach, right? So we have the the plant varieties and the genetics and but there's more to it than that there's there's the rotations there's the chemical issues we're dealing with there's the soil structure there's the regenerative nature and what what and, and that takes that takes all of us right that takes the farmers feedback it takes communication it takes the agronomists in the field it takes the researchers sitting at the lab 
it takes, and how does that happen, right? You have the organizations like the Northern Pulse Growers that our checkoff dollars are going into a fund and that gets distributed and organized accordingly and, and given the priorities. And so um, we're all in it together because at the end of the day, um, if the farmer's making money, everybody's, it helps downtown, it helps Main Street, it helps the retailers, it's, we're all here. And if, but if we're not making, if we're not bringing any dollars off the land, um, we're all in that together too. Yeah. So. The impact here is that big. It's our most economical crop and you're telling us we can grow it 10% of the time instead of 50%? That's a huge impact. Oh, the first step is to like set down the addictive cup of lentils and step back a little bit. Um, peas have been more resilient to the disease, but that's not saying they're not a host. They're a part of the problem, even though we've been able to grow peas. So it's really easy to say stop growing lentils because they look terrible and you're not making any money. But now I'm going to tell you like your second most profitable crop, you have to stop growing that too. Even though it looks fine right now because it's part of the problem in the lentils. So first of all, we just have to like step back a little bit, which is a really hard conversation to have for everybody. Um, we need to look at what are we going to grow instead. Each farm is going to have to make decisions on their fields. That's the that's the big picture the winter time stuff right now you know manage the crop you have it's worth a lot so whatever didn't die don't walk away from it um if there's areas that don't make sense that aren't performing like they're supposed to that's established and turn yellow it's getting on the phone and getting people out here to, to collect the samples and it's pretty hard to tell people we need research funding when we can't even prove the disease we have because right. we just combined it whether it's the extension service the agronomist somebody that's working out of the community to help get those resources so we can collect the samples, have the data. I mean, for a while, we we honestly were pretty sure it was a phantomyces, but we didn't have samples that definitively proved that just because it was July and it got combined and like, where in the field was it? Uh, over there? I mean, how do you go back and sample that in October? I mean, at, at our level of diagnostic, diagnosing this, when we see injury, we're sampling the diseased plants versus good quality, you know, looking good lentils. As soon as you see it is really important for a phantomyces because otherwise you're just gonna find fusarium. Um, and I think, you know, where do you, a lot of that at a farmer level, it's calling in help so that you're not right. the one trying to figure out whether you take soil samples or plant samples or like, what do you want? It's getting the researchers here. We are a long ways from the universities. So that, <laughs> I mean, that takes, <laughs> you don't just show up in Plentywood, Montana from 10 hours away with your soil truck to do your soil testing. So working with people to make sure ahead of time that we know we need to be doing it, but then in the field, right. talking to people so we get the right information. So the frustrating part of the, as a farmer, is what, what do you do, right? Yeah. We're used to fixing things and, you know, we have lots of problems in farming, but most of them, you can hit the reset button over the winter and, and do something else there's a solution for and the only solution to this is to not grow them and that's not necessarily very digestible yeah so i think one of the things that's been really challenging with this is as a farmer you're not too worried about what's killing my lentils and lots of times when we find it in july like we said it just gets combined the researchers need us to slow down and be a little more scientific with this because knowing what it is, is it a phantomyces, is it fusarium, that's how we do the next steps, that's how we get the plant breeding, that's how we make those adjustments in the crop rotation. But it's been challenging to slow down and get the better data that, th that we need to have big picture wise. Because um, I'm not sure you care what we call it. I don't. Yeah. As a farmer, we <laughs> it's it, dead. we care what it does to our bottom line. Um, but understanding, sitting through some of the presentations, uh, I mean, we have a long ways to go, right? Yeah. We're we're trying to quantify if we have it or not, and and we're not talking about. Let's talk about levels of what level we have it at. We know we have this. Let's let's measure how how do we measure the level in this field versus that field? And then if we do change our rotation, what's our what is our baseline? Yeah. Right? And, and where are our risk factors? Because um, this fail, field may be a wreck, but we've got some lentils that look phenomenal. And so we're going to go, what are we going to do next year, so does right? does that mean we can grow lentils again? On we're going to grow lentils. <laughs> 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 it's, you're gambling, right? Yeah, you are. Um, and this is dry land farming. We're pretty good gamblers. Like, it might oh. not rain. It'll be fine. Yeah, and, you know, for how much, for how good lentils have been to this community, 
even if you miss every once in a while, you're going to keep raising them because yeah. our alternatives are not profitable. Right. No, absolutely. As you can see, there are major challenges with root rot. It's going to take all stakeholders involved to be very collaborative to find solutions so that there is a future for the pulse acre in Montana and North Dakota going forward. For more air resources, please visit pulsecropsipm.org. This work was supported by the USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture Crop Protection and Pest Management Program through the North Central IPM Center.